This video was helped greatly made possible by the support of our amazing patrons. Thank you guys again, you are awesome. Welcome back to Affinity for Commander and our latest episode of For the Love of Commander. Today I'm joined by a great friend of the channel, Chris, and would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, so my name's Chris, I've appeared on your channel a couple of times now. I'm a level one judge and I've actually been playing Magic since it came to the UK in 1995. Um, I've been playing Commander pretty much since it existed. We started playing in January 2009 just after Shards of Alara, the second block, Conflux came out. Um, it had only just become a sort of worldwide format in 2008, at the end of the year. Um, we picked up on it, and we've been playing it ever since. Just for a brief context, Chris started playing in 1995. Martin and I were born in 1993 and 1994, respectively. So, oh, teach us, oh, Grandmaster. And today, all we are doing is discussing the topic that I've seen a lot of people discussing with the new Ultimate Masters set being announced. Chris, is Commander too expensive? So, I'll give you the easy answer. Commander is as expensive as you want it to be. Well, there you go, kids. Time to go home now. It's, <laughs> it's been answered. In reality, if you want to play in tournaments at Grand Prix and win, yes, Commander is far too expensive. If you want to play at a kitchen tabletop with a couple of friends that have only just started playing, Commander costs nothing. Mm -hmm. See, I would agree with that. It's a very much, it's very much, when you sit down, you have to say to someone, what game do you want to have? Do you want to turn three game or do you want to turn 18 game? Which we have had that. If you want to play the nine and the 10 decks, yeah, you probably need a few food chains, a few Cabal Coffers and Urborgs. But if you want to sit down and just hit someone with a huge amount of dinosaurs, that's relatively cheap. But then we run into the problem of, oh, but I want to be better, but I'm poor. We're students. We don't have all this money, but we want to be better. Is there a way of being better without taking out a second mortgage on your house? There's always ways to be better. I mean, Magic's existed for well over 25 years. There's thousands of cards out there that are incredibly powerful that are worth next to nothing because nobody's thought of using them in the right way. There's dozens and dozens of YouTube videos out there that say, here's an expensive card, here's a suitable budget alternative. Example, Guy's Cradle, why not use it the Mock Cradle of the Sun? I, I, I will go as far as saying I like that card better because it replaces itself and Guy's Cradle can occasionally tap for nothing. It taps for green anyway. The only difference being that you can't get your guy's cradle cross and verged before it can flip. This is true. This is very true. Also, a small shout out to Budget MTG, who are very good at this. I love those guys. So, ultimately, you can take your budget deck that's cost you $20, buy $10 worth of cards, and make it 10 times better than it is. But the question that I suppose back to you is, is that deck ever going to be as good as the person that spent $10,000 on their card, has force of will, has food chain, has everything that they could ever want to stop your combos and stop your aggression and just win on turn three, or toy with you and win on turn 10? Because they can. And I'll answer your question with another question. Beating Is beating them the only way to win the game? Because there was a very good story of this where I went to a competitive commander event and there was me playing Mizix of the Ismagus, my properly done out will control you to death deck. Someone else was playing General Tazri and the person to my right was playing Mono Blue uh, Teferi. They were all combo, there was dual lands everywhere, but the fourth person was playing King Macabre. And every single time the Macabre player said, can I do this? We all looked over, went, yes, sure. And then we all went back to staring at each other's manner very intensely. And we did nothing. And then the King Macabre player won. Because he essentially he just locked us all out of the game very slowly and we didn't notice. And he won. And his deck was probably worth half of one dual land. But then that's not the usual way for it to happen. But if... If your playgroup is the type to drop all the money in the world, then I would probably say you would have to invest a little bit. 
But at the same time, you need to have that conversation of, look, guys, I would like to play this magic. Could we drop it a few levels? But it's up to that playgroup. That playgroup might say, we, but we like having turn three, in which case, mm, that's not very healthy. It's not very nice. It's not very healthy. It's not very nice, but there's always another playgroup. There's always another playgroup. Equally, I will always rest on um, Martin's set on deck, which it's probably missing two $10 cards, and it could easily kill you on turn four. Quite easily. But he doesn't have those two $10 cards because he doesn't want that deck to be like that. He wants it to be, I'm going to play some druids and we'll see what happens. He doesn't want it to be, I know exactly the line of play I'm going to do from the opening hand and you are all dead. I've always found the best combos and the best strategies that know what they're doing to turn four win. They've taken a lot of time and research as well as the money. Mm. And some of the games that I played, especially recently in Chester, I've kind of sat down, having put generically good cards into my deck and gone, oops, there's a combo here. Oops, there's a strategy here. I'm chosen not to play them because all these things, again, come down to a choice as much as money. Because just because you've got that combo, just because you've got that strategy, just because your setter's and deck has got those two $10 cards in, doesn't mean you need to play them or use them. Exactly. There are much... Um, Josh Lee Quire made a good point on this in his recent um, podcast where he said there are times at the GP where they'll be having a nice game and he'll have the meanness in his hand but then not use it because they're just having a nice casual game but then someone else will do something mean and go oh right the game's now changed I didn't realise and then does the meanness which that seems fine but again it all comes back to, do you want to have that type of mean game, or do you want to have a nice friendly game, which can relate to price a bit, but it doesn't have to. It depends. Do you want to have six casual decks? Do you want to have one incredibly finely tuned, will kill you deck? So it's as Chris said at the very beginning, magic can be as expensive as you want, but if we're going to tournaments then do you think there is a sort of set list where you're not getting to run a hundred cards, you get to run about maybe 80 cards because the other 19 have to be your tutors, your searches, your combo pieces. Do you think that's a problem? I think it is a problem. And I think there's an even more obvious problem than having to run those 19 tutors and counter spells and I oops, I win strategies. And it's the underlying problem that very good mana fixing brings to the game along the lines of fetches and jewels and along the lines of the players that put soul ring in versus the players that refuse to put soul ring in and the players that, for example, Johnny, who's been on the channel, I believe, he has a strategy that if soul ring's in his opening hand, he mulligans soul ring away. Mm. Because he, he's happy to draw it on turn two or turn ten, but he doesn't ever want to start the game with it, so the game can have a fair balance. Hmm. And those good mana decks and those good mana fixing decks usually have the edge on those bad mana and those budget mana decks. And the mana base is the bigger issue than having to have those 19 oops I win, protect myself from oops I win cards. So would you say having the mana fixing is more important than... The other expensive cards. You, if if you had a random hundred dollars laying around, you would have to go. No, this is for those fetches. Yes, straight away. Straight away, without a shadow of a doubt. These are for the fetches. These are for the mana rocks. These are for, you know what? Something like days that mm. can easily stop a combo, and that's a two dollar card if you get the right version. You don't have to run force of will to be able to stop things. You've got pact of negations, another very good one that stops strategies awesome. and slaughter pact. Oh, I love slaughter pact. But without the mana base to support the strategies, the defense, the deck, that $100 is wasted. So, Chris, what you're saying is we shouldn't build expensive cards or build expensive decks. We should just build blue trolley decks. Well, everybody wants a blue trolley deck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so, so true. <laughs> I I've never fully understood the players that go, oh, I don't really like blue, or oh, I don't really like this color or this strategy, and... I kind of get you like your colours and your strategy, but you've got to be open to explore the variety that's magic. 
hmm, there is, there is always something to be said for when you give yourself a challenge of, I want to build a budget deck that still wins. Because we did a budget deck on the channel not long ago, and it might appear in a future episode, we'll see. <laughs> but that deck is still pretty good. I've still won with that deck, and it's still really fun. And it really didn't cost me a lot, because, again, you can buy it for $25. About six months ago, I made a Silvala Explorer Return deck. I wanted to make an Elf Ball deck. I did not know that by putting just the Elves I had, I didn't spend a penny. Just the Elves I had would give me a very consistent turn for Endgame because of Umbral Mount. Oh, yeah. You know, there's so many strategies out there where the deck itself is twenty, thirty dollars but you can still be competitive with it. Mm. Budget decks can be powerful. It's just they usually are limited to only one or two colours. That is true, because then you have to spend more money on the fixing, as I just said. All those pricey, pricey jewel lands. But then, if I jumped ahead a bit, so we're looking at solutions to that, which would be you can still have cheap and effective budget decks. And now we get to go on to the lovely bit of controversy that everyone loves to talk about, the new upcoming Ultimate Masters set, which, from the spoilers, looks amazing. Looks exactly what we've needed for years. Yeah, which I think was to shown their hand too much, because now they've shown they are deeply aware of what cards everyone wanted and everyone needed. So we know you're aware of this problem, and you're now choosing to do something about it, which is great! Gaddock, Teague, Micaeus, Snapcaster, Mage... Reanimate. Er Reanimate, Urborg, Noble Hierarch. This is going to be a nightmare to edit. Manlands. All the Manlands coming all back. All the Manlands. Celestial Colonnade. So They're actually, amazing in Commander. They are. Um, Engine Explosive is a little bit less, but still a really expensive card. Tarmogoy Flesso. Tarmogoy Flesso, unless it's Dual Commander. Yep. Lily Iron of the Veil obviously gets a place in Dual Commander... Yeah, but outside of Dual Commander, I don't think that should be played in Commander. Oh, God, no, absolutely not. Um, Mana Vault. Edric's by Master of Trest is banned as a Commander, but I just love saying that too much not to mention it. But there's still so many other cards that we need. There are a lot of other cards that we need, but they've now said that's the last Master set. For the time being. For the time being. There's going to be something. But then, so this is our solution to the problem of magic being too expensive. We have supplementary products that are reprints that will then increase the amount of them in the world and lower the value of them because there's more. The small problem with this that is just the tiniest thorn on the rose is the rather large MSRP of what, $340, I think. $15 a booster? Yes. $15 a booster. With what they've actually announced around the price point and the special three booster bundle that they're doing, which I believe that was at about $35, it makes the cost of buying the 24 boosters that would be a booster box somewhere around the $280 mark rather than the $340 yes. a box. Yes, the professor said this, because essentially it means that the box topper is being sold to you for $60. Yes. Which, don't get me wrong, if someone said to you, would you like to buy this alternative foil full art Lily Eye of the Veil for $60? Who would say no? There's not a person alive who would not break off the hand of that dealer. Yeah. But at the same time, would you like this foil full art Lava Crawl Regent? No, not Lava Claw Reaches. Lava Claw Reaches. Lava Claw Reaches, the black red manland. And nobody would want that. No, one, or Kitchen Finks. I wouldn't mind a Kitchen Finks. You wouldn't mind, but you wouldn't pay $60 for it. In the dark, not knowing what I was getting, I'd be happier with a Kitchen Finks than I would a Lava Claw Reaches. True, true. But I think the biggest thing that wizards are saying is that commander players are magpies that like their shiny alternate art cards, which. Yes, that's true, but from my experience, Commander players more like their consistent decks mm. that they then like to foil out and get the shiny yes. cards for, rather than, oh, this is a shiny card, so I'm going to build a deck around this brand new shiny full art foil alternate thing yeah. that I've never had before. I do often find that if I sit down with someone and I notice their deck is uh, foiled out, I'm immediately a little bit more on the back foot 
Because to me, that says that they have perfected that deck to such a point that they now want to laminate it. They now want to say, this is so perfect, I can now just put a nice shiny vanilla coat on all of it. See, I have a slightly different school of thought when I sit down against players like that. Mm. They're very closed off. They're not open to the fact that a new standard set might give them a fantastic card that they need. They've got their deck perfect and sorted and done. There's no tweaking to be done. This old card that came out 22 years ago that everybody's forgotten about, they're not going to put that in their deck because their deck's closed and sorted and done. Yeah. They're not open to new strategies and they're great to play against if you've got something out of the box unexpected. Yes, I do love that. I do love the randomness of Commander of, what does that card do? I love that feeling. But do we think that Ultimate Masters, even with the ridiculously high MSRP that currently... I've seen a lot of places not even selling it. You can get a box for 248 euros on um, card market. Do we think that Ultimasters will help the prices? Will it help Commander? I don't think it's going to change the prices or change the Commander. I think it's so misguided in the price point that the initial idea the initial reasoning behind making this product is just forgotten i've been going in oh, sorry i've been going into local card shops like tabletop game shop where we're now doing recordings do. the shopkeeper's not even going to order any product he's he's going to see if enough people sign up to a draft to maybe buy one box because he knows that people won't buy it from him for smaller stores it's just not even a possibility because the risk to reward ratio is just way too high because you can't buy that in from the supplier if no one buys it around where you are and you will then have to drop the price and you could end up losing money because of it. And I'd like to make a a slightly controversial argument that the biggest commander player base is no longer at kitchen tables but is now in the local shops in the little high street of town in the back office corner that you know you no longer play it at your home but you come more to play it in the shops because the shops are now that easily accessible across the world it might be for us we we live in a very small country chris we do we do but from when i was playing when i was a lot younger and from when i was playing when i was at university in 2008 there wasn't a shop to go and play it yeah, you said the, uh, we didn't have a shop in Liverpool. We didn't have a shop in Chester. The only shop we had was in Manchester. That's a bit of a drive. For anyone who doesn't know, that's a bit of a drive. You know, and that's quite a large area of the UK that 10 years ago, we didn't have a shop you could go play at. So when Commander first came out, it was a kitchen table event. Mm. Now, it's a in-the-local-game-store event. Uh, and I, I don't think that is just local to a small country like the UK. Mm. I think you look at across most of Europe, across most of America, you'll find similar trends. Local game stores are a lot easier to open, a lot better supported, and everybody wants to go to a centralised location. And you also get a lot more variety of people you meet and decks you play against. But then it goes on to another point of, does the Ultimate Masters box, if we're saying it doesn't support Commander as well as it could have done, does it support the local game store as well as it could have done? Not even remotely. As you said, they're not going to make such a huge risk on product that might not sell. Mm. They're certainly not going to buy singles because they can't afford to buy singles. The price that they'd make is nothing. They're therefore not going to buy boosters because they're just going to have boosters sat on their shelf. They might sell 10 boosters out of a box of 24 and then they're just out of pocket. And they're not going to buy boxes unless they've got a group already ready to draft it. So, so far we've got... The box that is not helping our local game stores, that's not helping Commander players with prices, who is it helping? Collectors. Collectors. Large stores that can afford to buy the products so that they can market up the individual cards and sell the individual cards to the players that, yes, they'll go and buy a Singleton Gadictique. No, they won't buy a whole box. No. Well, the shop that's bought the boxes and opened them they're going to make that tiny little profit. So the large shops, they're going to get helped and supported by this. The shops like Channel Fireball, Star City Games, in the UK, Magic Madhouse, Mana League. Mm -hmm. In Europe, Magic Car Market is going to see the benefit of this. Mm -hmm. You know, Not to say that it's bad or wrong for them to do so. It's perfectly justifiable. It's right for them to do Mm -hmm. so because we want them to remain in business to support us. Mm -hmm. But they're not the ones that needed the help and support that this product is designed to do. So what would you say would be the thing that would 
help. So to help people who are looking to go into modern, people who are looking to up their commander decks to get those more expensive cards and to think of helping smaller stores. So in one cohesive statement, Chris, solve the magic problem. Print Ultimate Masters at a quarter of the price. With more print runs. With more print runs, more availability. You asked for one statement. Yeah. So more print runs, more availability, and add more reprints into it. And something that personally I'd have liked to have seen, you know, I've been playing a long time. I have got a lot of the cards that are in this set already. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen a couple of new cards. Nothing mm. too spicy, nothing too exciting, but a couple of new cards that might enable legacy players, maybe a vintage player like Brightling, to have a little bit of fun and experimentation, and a couple of new cards that might have changed the commander format a little bit, brought new strategies in, maybe a new legend. Well, that is an excellent segue into something else I want to talk about. So we've looked at Alter Masters, and we said it's probably not going to be helpful to commander players. It's not going to help the question of is commander too expensive, but Battle Bond... Battle Bond was great. That was a fantastic set. That commander player's dream. That that was Commander Masters. There was there was doubling season, land tax, mystic confluence, a whole host of new legends. There was there's now a new competitive commander. A whole new cycle of lands. Whole new cycle specifically of lands. for multiplayer formats. That are absolutely great. Assist, what a great mechanic that was. Yeah. And it was a two headed giant draftable set. It was Exactly what you want at a reasonable price. However, now look at the price of those cards. So soon after it came out, and some of these cards are up there in the top 50 of Magic's cards' expense. For the new cards, yes. But they have helped with prices like doubling season and land tax, which have seen not a massive drop, but a bit... Enough of a drop. Enough of a drop to be noticeable, to say, look... This helps. But actually, that, that's the type of supplementary product that Commander players all rejoiced and went, this, more of this, that's what we want. Because I do, th I do think that we get a bit complacent. Because as a format, Commander is more supported than Modern. So much more that we expect more. But if we look at a because I used to play Modern, as you know. I still do. You still do. And Modern gets next to no support, despite it being one of the main events at a GP. When has Commander ever been the main event at a GP? It, I don't think it ever will, because no. it's an unsanctioned Exactly, format. Exactly. But at GP Liverpool, the one we're going to, plug, plug, um, it's Team Modern, is it not? Unified Team Modern. Unified Trials. Team... Yes. There is not a Modern product every year aimed directly at modern players with the consistency and the level that the Commander products are put out every single year. Well, that was what the Masters products were supposed to the, be. That's what they were was, meant to that be, That was yeah. the intention. It was to support the modern community, bring about much-needed reprints, because let's be honest, nothing in modern's on the reserve list. It can't be just because of the format and its rules. Why not reprint them? Yeah. What? Why Why is Tarmogoyf not just reprinted every single year? Why aren't the fetches from Zendikar reprinted every other no. year? And if you look at the best master sets, which indisputably was 2017, they had fetches. Snapcaster Major Liliana, Tarmogoyf, Blood Moon, Damnation. Noble Hierarch? Noble Hierarch. Everything that anyone could have possibly wanted, and everyone loved it. However, it still didn't help the prices that much because it was still quite an expensive supplementary it, product. It was. It wasn't a battle bond. It wasn't a conspiracy. No. It was affordable for... People that are unemployed or people that work on the minimum wage level under the living wage mm. that can just about afford to maybe buy a booster a week and maybe buy entry to an F&M, they can't pay £10 on top of that for a premium booster. No. Or more, as Ultimate Masters could be when it hits shelves, oh, if it hits shelves. Mm. But it wasn't original like that. It was meant to be a $6 a pack thing. But then people re then wizards realised that shops were upticking the prices and they went, well, we can do that. Shops were upticking the prices because they got a lot less of the stock than they ordered. Mm. It was such a limited print run that they lost out on what they were hoping to be able to offer their customers. They had to up the prices because they'd budgeted to get such a reward back that they couldn't afford to not. But then I did make Wizards realise that they could charge $10 yep. for those packs. 
which now made it the set standard that they could charge ten dollars for the packs of every modern master set, which again didn't help the price. And there were a lot of master sets that was resoundingly looked down upon by the rest of the community for not having the reprints that were required. But you're absolutely right. Battle Bond was exactly what I wanted. The master sets were what could have been helpful as well. But do you think we, as commander players, are a bit complacent with we want our format to be cheaper when we have the greatest control over our format? You can't sit down at a modern FM and go, right, can we all play casually? You can easily do that with a commander game, though. But you wouldn't sit down to a commander FM. This and is true. There are shops that do a commander FM as a rare occurrence. They usually have their own ban list, and they almost always have some kind of league and point system mm. that if you sit down and kill everybody on turn three, you're probably going to get so many negative points you won't win that FNM. You know, that there's answers to these that shops have when they do offer it in that way that you couldn't do to modern, you couldn't do to standard, and you couldn't do to legacy. You couldn't set, oh, this standard event, we're going to put a price cap on it. This modern event, your deck can't be worth more than $200. Who's ever going to turn up to that? In fact. What would you call Infect a deck at the minute? <laughs> but no, you wouldn't sit down to a game of any other format other than Commander and say, my deck is a seven, what's your deck? Your deck's a nine? Okay, I'm going to go play this other group. Mm. Your deck's a three? Oh, I'm going to change my deck to this one. You wouldn't do that in mm. any other format. But then do you think that is the automatic solution to people complaining that the format is too expensive? Or if you think the format's too expensive, then just play with other people then. It's a very callous way to say it. But that is an answer I've seen people give. Well, isn't that magic? If you can't compete at the level that you're playing at, either play with a different group or invest more to compete at that level. Mm. Whatever format you look at, you, Commander, there's slight ways around it, but there's not many. No. Uh, oh, so I can always go back to, you can still build budget competitive decks that, yes, you might have to splash out for that one crater hoof, but you only have to buy the one. You don't have to buy four. But you're never going to splash out on that one guy's cradle if you're in the no. splashing out on the individual card. No, God, no. You're not even going to splash out on that individual jewel land anymore. No, not anymore. Which A year ago you might have done. Might, uh, year ago, but then that's also the problem of Commander, of it being too expensive, which we'll go now on to another little bane of, I think, everyone in the community, one that the OG Rosewater himself has said he would change if he could, the reserved list. And all the lovely cards that are locked behind that wall and will never get reprinted and will continue to be massively expensive. I think that's a dangerous topic and I think that's a dangerous way to say it, that they'll never be reprinted. The original agreement was for a period of time that's now passed. Hmm. The original agreement was to protect the integrity of the game that it protected. And to be honest... Most of the cards on the reserve list are absolute garbage when you look at cards in today's <laughs> market that aren't used, that are under $5, even though they're on the reserve list. It's only a select few cards on the reserve list that have the issue of price and being unavailable. Mm. That these days, I genuinely think, if Magic's still going in 10 years, why would anybody care if they'd reprinted the reserve list? Now, there'll be a little bit of noise about it. Mm. In 10 years' time... They're not. There's not going to be any noise. There's not going to be any lawsuits. If Wizards make a statement that say in five years' time we're going to be reprinting cards from the reserve list, we give you five years to sell them if you're worried about the value, what would be the issue with that? I'll, I'll leave that up to the Magic Lawyer, who I will link in the description because you should go watch him. He's great. But for the time being, as I say, I've sat down with people who play General Tarsri or Prosh, and the first thing they do every turn, unless they have, you know, pre-game plays, is fetch land, dual land. How much do you think that affects the game? Do you do you honestly do you think that having those if it's General Tarsby, ten, let, let's say we're playing Mr. Burns here, and they have those ten dual lands in their deck, how much of a difference do you think that actually makes to their ability to play the game? I think it's what enables them to play the game. You know, I've played five color decks with bad mana bases where you play the tri lands and it always comes into play tap lands and you're always a turn behind everyone else. And the player that combos on turn five, while well, you haven't even been able to untap with five lands, 
that's a real feel bad. Mm. As opposed to playing the five color decks where you've got the fetches and shocks, a halfway point. Mm. Yes, you can still play. Yes, you've got your fix in. But you've lost a lot more life and can't activate greed as often as the person that's got the original jewels. You can't activate Erebos. You can't knowingly play effects like Bitter Blossom and Phyrexian Arena because you've taken quite a bit of damage three a turn just from playing your lands. You're also a lot more susceptible to decks that do win through combat damage. Yeah. Even if it's just something like Perforos. Aggro deck get a big advantage against you just because you're playing five colours and playing shocks. So the players that can play the duels, they get the best of everything. They really do have a strong advantage. And it doesn't seem like a lot. Two life per land. Well, actually, when I've played effects like Zozu the Punisher, two life per <laughs> land is a big deal. It really makes you think about, am I going to play fetch and get a shock? Because suddenly, that's not just three life. That's seven life. Which we we had a game. Uh, what was it about two days ago where that happened? We and, did. Oh, that adds up quickly. It does. It does add up quickly. But it does add up quickly. You usually got an aggro player at the table of some variant. You're gonna get attacked and picked on first because you've got the jewels and they haven't. And there's a little bit of a jealousy factor going on. Players that go, oh, yeah. you've spent so much money. I'm gonna attack you because I can't be in your shoes. But if you're in a group where everybody's got those fetches and those jewels and everybody's got that advantage, it's an even playing field. Mm. If if everyone has jewels, no yeah. one has jewels. Yeah, that's okay. a good way to put it. Yeah. Yes, we definitely need more stuff by Battle Bond. If you want to play that, there are certain circumstances to it. Yes, you can invest money, but it's not relevant if you really want to have the best deck, unless you really want to go down the combo route. I have seen another suggestion for some of the cost of cards, and this isn't something that's possible with local play happening in local game shops, but it's gold bordered cards. The idea that gold bordered cards and the world championship decks that came out years ago that you can buy a guy's cradle for ten dollars. Mm. Pseudo proxies. Pseudo proxies. They're really high quality proxies because they're actually made by wizards. Yeah. But they're not allowed in any shop that's sanctioned by wizards. No. Would would you be comfortable? Well, imagine if me and you, you're playing what's your most expensive deck? Well, my most expensive deck's gotta be Sarah's Gitrog. Okay. So if we're playing Gitrog that you I have played Gitrog, and it's a fairly high end deck. But say you pimped it out more. Let's say you literally went for that Bayou. Let's say you went for the Verdon Catacombs Ancient Tomb. You went all out, and I sat down with my Mizix deck with cards like my um, Jewel and my Scalding Tar, my Your Force, Force of Will. Um, and we sat down. Would you not feel a little bit of not animosity, but some bad feels to the person sat across from you? who is playing General Tazri, but everything in their deck that's allowing them to play that deck is gold-bordered. Yes, I would. Mm. I would feel a little bit of animosity against players that are having to use gold-borders when I've got money on the cards. But it's a pseudo-fix. It's mm. a fix for a local group that's struggling with not being able to buy mm. jewels and fetches for each other. It's something you would have to... You would absolutely have to say, guys, is this okay? Yes, it's a conversation to have with your player group, not something to turn up to a different store no. and say, right, I'm doing this now. Like the players that will turn up to a different store and have some unhinged or unglued or unstable. <laughs> and I sit down against them and I'm a judge and I'm staring at the field and they've got three silver border cards and I'm just like, this is not okay. But when you try and have that conversation, they say, it's fine, it's commander, it's a casual format. Which if they want to do that, that's fine. But if you're wanting to do that in an event, or you're wanting to go to a different playgroup, that needs to be a conversation to have, not something to be assumed. The other point that I have, do you ever find, relating to the expense of magic, that there is a certain amount of snobbery that comes with it, but going the other way upwards, it's not the people with the jewels and the fetches that look down their noses, but it's the people who like to play janky decks, it's the people that like to play just normal six, five level decks who look to the people with the jewels and go, oh, you've spent money on that deck. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. Mm. I, I have looked at people like that before. Like, I was at GP, I think it was, um, at, not that long ago, 
it was a standard GP and I made day two, didn't do very well on the day two, but you know, I was wandering around the GP mm. on the Sunday afternoon and I happened across a people playing in this commander game. And three of them had double sleeve decks, quite expensive looking decks, dual lands on the table. One of them had triple sleeved his decks in top loads. Wow. And when I looked, I realized why. This was before Battle Bond. Okay. And he went land tax into everything else in his deck was foil. And he'd made a point of saying he didn't have a foil land tax because he couldn't have one. <laughs> but everything else in his deck that was possible to be a foil was a foil. And his deck was worth upwards of £10,000. And I was like, you could have bought a house for that. You could have easily bought a house for that. That level of snobbery that exists, that exists in me. I look down on him for that choice to have such an expensive deck when there's so many other things that he could have had. But you know what? Maybe to him, that deck is worth more than a house would be to somebody like me. Maybe he's, ha he's happy with a minimalist lifestyle with just that deck, which eh, it's not for us to judge. If that's what you want to do, you you go for it, Sonny Jim. But I can't help judging when it, people seem to be able to spend more money than I can on a card game that I love. Mm. It makes me feel like I'm not spending enough and I'm inadequate in the money that I do put in and I, we do put in a lot of money into this game most people do mm. and that resentment drives itself into negative feelings towards other individuals that are probably in a better financial place that have a better job and can have mm. more expendable income on it so then relating that back to our original question is commander too expensive it then very much depends on what you define as expensive for example some people will say I think I'll put it up on the screen, but uh, from memory, Crater Hub Behemoth is around about $20 now. A lot of people will look at that and go, that's too expensive for a magic card. I have found myself moving more, moving more to the side of that's an okay amount. I did not think that when I first started playing Commando, when I had a Keranos God of the Storms deck that was 50% counter, 50% burn, that's what deck was. But now I'm looking at that going, I do need two Creator Hoof Behemoths because my financial situation has changed and I justify it to myself by saying it's for the channel. But <laughs> That's a nice justification. Always. But at the same time, is Commander too expensive? It depends what you think is expensive because I found my definition of expensive for Commander changing. And one thing to touch on there is that a lot of this also depends upon your age. Oh, yeah. Because, and it's not always true, the older that you get, the more comfortable you start to get in life. The The job situation is you're no longer unemployed all the time. You're usually in work finding a slightly better job and a slightly yeah, better you, job. You tend to accrue more capital as you age. You do. And you tend to be a little bit better at budgeting, a little bit better at saving, and mm. a little bit better at going, well, yeah, I do have an extra £20 at the end of the month that I can spend on this group of behemoth. But when you're in university, well, suddenly you're having to choose between playing magic, studying, buying a new book, maybe going to the gym, you're shopping for the week, you know, or going out and drinking with your mates, which, let's be honest, is what most people choose. Absolutely. Um, when you're at university, as opposed to when you're 25 and working and working, different costs are prohibitive or less prohibitive based upon your circumstances. Hmm. And like you, 10 years ago, I looked at a card like Creator of £20. Oh my God, I'm not touching that with a barge pole. <laughs> Now I look at a card like Cradoff and I go, yeah, I'll add it to my weekly shopping list. Need one of them now. Yeah. Maybe in five years' time I'll go, hey, that dual land, £200? Yeah, I'll add it to the shopping list. I doubt it, but yeah. yeah I doubt it. But that, that would be... See, we idealise that, but then we would, the, we would then become the people... That right that now are, we hate. Yeah, the other people. I would say I hate, but yeah, that we do look down, ironically, we look down our nose on the people that, with more money. And are in better financial conditions. How, how weird the world is. We might be looking down our noses at people that eat nothing but rice every single day because they spend all their money on yeah. the dual lands. Or the budgeted. They've made that decision in life that that's what they want to accrue. Right? It will sound odd, but me and Sarah, we've got a mattress that's worth £2,000. Because we value a good night's sleep and our ability to work effectively the next day a lot more than a new sofa, a new magic hut. Yeah. 
So we'll try and have a little bit, and we say that so far we're not overly excited, excited anticipating Ultimate Masters. I'm happy that it's causing some prices to drop. Cards like Gaddic T, Micaeus, Snapcast, they've all been dropping, and I think that's been helped by Ultimate Masters, which is great. But we do think there are grave issues with it. As I think everyone is hyper aware of, there are definitely budget alternatives if you want to build a competitive deck, but there are still issues with it. A little bit of research, a little bit of time taken to decide actually yeah, here's a really good card. I can't afford it. Let's find an alternative. It's a good solution, but it's not a perfect one. So we'll relate it all back. Chris, do you think EDH is too expensive? So I think I go back to my first answer. EDH is as expensive as you want to make it. Which I think is always the conclusion that I always draw when they ask me a deep question on Commander <laughs> is have a proper, cool, and discussion with your playgroup about what type of game of Commander you want to have. Is it too expensive? As much as you want it to be. Chris, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for watching and don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe. And thank you again to our fantastic patrons. You can also follow us on Twitter at 4Commander.